we teach in the young youth today. Yeah, so if the young ones could uh, make your way to the uh, various classes, it'd be great. Thank you. Let's just uh, open this time and very briefly. Father, we pray for your wisdom. Your wisdom, not ours. Father, we pray that uh, you will guide us in your word to what uh, your servant Paul was saying, inspired by the Spirit. Father, we ask for your help and your presence with us now in Jesus' name. Amen. So this is First Corinthians chapter 1. Um, it's very, very difficult to deal with this, uh, it's going in and out a bit, passage without actually referring to a lot of other things, but I'm going to try. That actually is Rome, uh, the Colosseum in the background, not Corinth. I don't have any pictures of Corinth. Um, conflict is a natural part of life. Well, our life. Sometimes, a lot of the time, it happens for all the wrong reasons. Pride, arrogance, greed, the search for power, the search for wealth, just the inability to get on with anyone else. And we see some of those things beginning very early in life. But sometimes conflict happens for good reasons. When an organization has goals that are unclear and a little bit of conflict develops over what is the goal and clarification is, is needed and it's all for. Paul was not a stranger to conflict. Certainly conflict with what Jesus Christ had done on the cross and his own upbringing. And uh, we're thankful that he actually lost that battle. Paul also had conflict with his close associate Barnabas, a situation that ended badly, and they went their separate ways. And looking in hindsight, I think Paul would agree there, there were some good reasons and some bad reasons uh, for that. But Paul has learned, and this whole book is about conflict, right from verse one of chapter one right to the end of chapter 16. It is a book that in many ways is about conflict and conflict resolution. And various organizations, many of them spend quite a bit of time and effort on conflict resolution. Jeff would have found that probably in the Air Force. Uh, when I worked for Fisher and Plygold, they spent a lot of effort on some of us that were involved in uh, uh, what they call problem solving teams, not problem solving between people, Problem solving and processes and machinery and that sort of thing. And they invested a lot of time and effort in problem solving. And that's what Paul's doing here. He's investing a huge amount of time in problem solving. But there are some things we need to pay attention to in his development of how to solve problems in the church. Because there is some huge difference. No other organization on the planet has the unique characteristics of a church. When there is conflict in a church, and I'm not just talking about Sunday morning, it could be between an individual, me, and the man sitting in the 16th row, 12th from the left, I won't name him, I have conflict with him. But you see, the problem here is that conflict involves everyone else in the church. But what is even worse, that conflict involves God. If at my work, with my workmates sitting in the office, we have conflict with each other, it doesn't really, well, actually, to some extent, it actually still involves God, because God lives in me and in you. But by and large, it's not a big component. But for a church, it is. All conflict in the church involves God. 
some form and some way. And that is the foundation for what Paul talks about in this book. Conflict resolution in the church starts with God. It actually finishes with God as well. It starts with God. It starts with what he has done in the coming of his son and the coming of the spirit or what we call the gospel message. <clears throat> so let's go through. I'm not going to deal with every verse of this chapter. Otherwise, we're going to be here for hours. So here's the first line. The church has so much going for it. Chapter 1, verses 1 to 9. The church has so much going for it. It has all the grace and blessings of God. Chapter 1, verse 4 says, I give thanks to my God always for you because of the grace of God the Father that was given to you in Christ Jesus, that in every way you were enriched in him in all speech and all knowledge, so that you are not lacking in any blessing as you wait for the revealing of our Lord Jesus Christ, who will sustain you to the end, guiltless in the day of the Lord Jesus Christ. They had all the blessings. We may wonder today, why does this church not have that blessing or that gift? Turns out there might be very good reasons to why not. But this church had them all. It had them all. And they really need to acknowledge they all come from God. Steve Vrien doesn't have this blessing because he worked hard at it. Or he prayed for it. Or he sought it. And I'm starting to steal the thunder from 1 Corinthians 12, 13, 14. So, read that one. All of the blessings come from the nature of God himself. I'm reminded a little bit of uh, Lord of the Rings. Some of you have seen the, the movies. Some more have probably even read the book. And you may remember the scene in the book uh, and the movies, and the movie didn't really do it justice, I thought. Give me the dwarf is sitting glum. They're about to leave the elven forest. And the queen speaks to him in the dwarven language. And Give me relates, and I think Tolkien really understood something here very important. That Gimli looks up into the Queen's eyes and he says it was like looking into the heart of an enemy and seeing only love and understanding there. So that's what we find in God. We look into the heart of God and what do we find? We find love and understanding. And even this church, in the midst of all their conflicts and all that they're doing, and what God might need to do in response, he is still a God who loves and understands. The next bit is... Um, are we running out of entry? I need to just put it on. They had the Apostle Paul on their side. Paul had invested so much into this church with all of what he did. And I'm not raising Paul up to be the same level of God or, or Christ or like that. But we need to remember that this is through uh, Paul, the Spirit, speaks to the, to the Corinthians. But it comes through Paul. Paul, again, understands the situation. He is on their side. He wants to see them resolve the issues. He wants them to grow and mature. Along with Peter, Apollos, and so many others. Paul is on their side. He has invested a lot in them, and he wants to see their growth. No, this is just doesn't seem to be working. Or it might be my power. No, it should be a, another point. Okay, while um, Ruby's sorting that out. Okay, every spiritual blessing, 
it's mentioned right there uh, that they have every spiritual blessing. It says gift, but I actually think the appropriate word here is blessing. It is actually the spirituals. Uh, my understanding is behind the Greek, but I will translate it as spiritual blessings. They have every spiritual blessing. And when you begin to understand them and consider them, they are absolutely amazing. One of them, um, Dr. J.I. Packer, a theologian who wrote the book Numbing God, made a comment in his chapter on adoption. He said that adoption is the highest blessing of salvation, even higher than justification, if you know the theology there a bit. Because adoption invites us into the relationships of God. This church was forgetting who they were. They were forgetting the God that had saved them. They were forgetting the very nature of the gospel. And so Paul, particularly here, and also he seeks to remind them that all that God had done on their behalf, but more importantly, all of who God was. Because the very nature of the gospel rests on who God is. There's a line in there that says, the Father has called us into fellowship, into the fellowship of the Son. And this is an important point, I think. It can be taken slightly two different ways. If you read the NIV, it's taken one way. If you read the ESV, it's taken another way. Both points are true. It's just not 100 clear exactly which point Paul is making here, and I can defend it both from elsewhere. But I'm going to go with the point here. The Father has called us into the fellowship of His Son. It can mean fellowship with His Son. That is very valid, and other parts of Scripture teach that. But I'm taking it here that the Father has called us into the fellowship that the Father has with the Son. We join into that fellowship that they have. The internal relationships of the Trinity have spread out to include you and I. Up to that point, up to the coming of the Spirit, on the day of Pentecost, no one could call God their Father other than the Son. Because only the Son was in that relationship with the Father. But God has adopted us through the death of the Son and the coming of the Spirit. And now we can call the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, we can call him Father as well. The relationship is spread out to include us. All these things are things that this is church has got. They're going for them, but they've forgotten them. They need to be reminded. This is what Paul does. He reminds them again. This is what God is like. This is what God has done. This is how you should be a full behave. They've forgotten them. <clears throat> yep. This destruction is coming from within. Some of you may have read the Old Testament. You might remember the story in Numbers of Phineas. I'm not going to talk about Phineas. I'm going to talk about Balaam. Balaam was uh, taken or, uh, by the king of Moab and was told that he was to curse the Israelites. God made it very clear through a talking donkey um, that uh, he was only to give the words that God gave him. And so he does, and the king of Moab gets rather upset at this. I called you here, I'm paying you a lot of money to curse them. Why are you blessing them? I can only respond as God gives me leave. Perhaps if I just see the tail of them, I might be able to curse them. And God makes it clear that no, it doesn't matter which portion or part you're going to look at, you're still going to bless them. But Balaam comes up with an idea. I want this money. Here's how you can get around the, the God's blessing. Get them to disobey their God, and God will punish them. And it was by the internal conflict against God. And God punishes them until Phineas stands up and inter intercedes with his actions. And, <clears throat> and so this is the way. You know, destroy from within. What do you do with the people where God is all for them? And they're obeying him and, and following him and doing everything he says. 
The only way you can pull them down and destroy them is to get them in conflict and disobedience amongst themselves. It's the only way you can do it. So this is a church that is on the brink of uh, destruction. It's coming. This is verses 10 to 17. Um, Paul says, I appeal to you, brothers and sisters, by the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, that you all agree and that there be no divisions among you, but that you be united in the same mind and the same judgment. He says quite a bit as well. They were divided over what they considered important. And that's a problem. Uh, basically, I have, I'm what's called an old earth creationist. Me, the age of the planet, is, is a red herring, it's a sidetrack. I certainly believe that God created the heaven and Eve as two individuals. But the age of the planet is a sidetrack, it's a red herring. We can, you know, I've got friends who believe that the planet is 7,000 years old. We get on, we talk, always talk about this issue when we meet, but we get on because we are both committed to what is central. We are both committed to the primary purpose of the church. And so this becomes a minor issue. Lindsay and I have discussions at times. Lindsay doesn't always agree with me. And occasionally Lindsay is actually right. Um, there. But we agree because there are important issues. We're never ever going to agree on everything. If we agreed on everything, we are then a member of a cult. You see, part of the problem is we need to understand what is primary, what is central, and what is peripheral, and least important. There's an old uh, German, I believe, a proverb that says the main thing is that the main thing remain the main thing. I would say, to be honest, that a lot of churches today, and at this church in Corinth, the main thing is being pushed out to the peripheral. And what is peripheral has become central. That is not a good state of affairs. And this is what's happened here at this church. As conflict, and I imagine that the conflict has grown small, didn't get resolved, and it's grown and grown and grown and grown. Until finally, some of them go to Paul because they don't know how to handle it anymore. Paul, we need wisdom. How do we deal with this, these issues? Because we can't deal with it anymore. Paul has to wield a heavy hammer. So these were people that were divided over what they considered was important. They were elevating people over men. And you see that over oh, time, sorry, they were elevating men. You know, basically, I'm of Paul, I'm of Apollos, I'm of Steve Reardon. And worse, there's a group that comes along and says, but I'm of Christ. Can you see the problem here? Raised men, lowered Christ. And that is a very sad state of affairs. And Paul says, who am I? Who's Apollos? Who's uh, Peter, who is Steve Reardon? You know, basically, hey, really, guys, we're nobodies. We really, really are nobodies. Picking up noise from somewhere. Um, it's a problem when we start having personalities. Because then what starts happening is, is we start taking the, what that person said as being gospel or true when perhaps it is not. And we can look throughout church history and see that. Augustine, the great theologian of North Africa, although actually he was really more of an apologist than a theologian, brought his Manichaeism uh, ideology from when he was a young man into his theology and has played the church ever since. This happens because people elevate men or women over the Bible and God. Paul, in contrast, knew exactly what was important. In contrast, Paul elevated the work of God over everything he did. This is the point he's trying to get at when he says, Yo, I didn't come to baptize. Other than the fact is that by baptizing, 
someone might start to think, well, actually, I was baptized in the name of all type of thing. Well, no, you wouldn't. But it's easy to see how that one might grow. And Paul says, well, I didn't come to baptize. I came to preach the gospel. This is the priority. This is what needs to be done. This is what I'm doing. I'm not doing that. And I don't care what you want me to do. I will do what God wants me to do. So in contrast to this church that has lost sight of what is important, Paul never did. It was always front and central to his work effort and mind. This church was divided over what they considered the poor important. Paul wasn't. And Paul comes back and he reminds them the gospel is what is important. The gospel is what is primary. The gospel is what is central. It's not peripheral. So the next point, 18 to verse 27, how to return from the brink. This church is standing on the precipice. There is a almighty hole in front of them. Take one step forward and you vanish. You've got to step back. You've got to step back. One of the things in conflict resolution that basically you've got to do is successful. And it's very easy to do because of the emotion is that you've got to de-escalate. And often in conflict, we start to escalate. I want to defend myself. I want to be seen to be right. And you know, when we get into conflict, we have an argument with the boss, the wife, or the husband, or the child, or something like that. We replay it back in our minds, don't we? Except when I replay it back in my mind, I always win. I always win that argument. Every time, if I argued the way it did in my mind, and other people argued as they did in mind, I'd be a wonderful fellow. You see, the problem here is it's all imaginary, it's all fantasy. Because winning an argument at the end of the day isn't about just logic, it's also about other things as well. Paul looks at, at how they were thinking. And says, this is some important things here. You've got to get right. This is now, how does the gospel begin to solve this, or begin, and the whole book's about it. How does the gospel begin to resolve the issues you're facing? It says in verse 18, For the word of, of the cross is folly to those who are perishing, but to those who are being saved is the power of God. And so he starts talking about wisdom and power. And he mentions in the passage uh, about um, uh, the wisdom and things like that. The Greeks search for wisdom. The Jews want power. And it's not, you know, equated exactly the same for different reasons. The Greeks were enamored with the argument. They loved to, you know, hearing someone, and you see that in, in um, uh, Paul's uh, talk, message on um, in Athens. And after giving probably what in the Bible is quite a short message, it's probably uh, might have been a couple of hours long. They said, "Well, actually, we'd like to come you to come back, and we'll hear some more about what you say." They didn't give a stuff about what he was really saying. They liked hearing a message. They were enamored of the search for wisdom. They liked the argument. And some people do, even today. You know, you hear two philosophers or two uh, different people going on, and they're not really listening to each other at all. I'm listening to this person say, but I'm going to respond with this point, at that point, and followed by that point. Oh, wait a minute, what did he say? They're not thinking them through what has been said. They're looking at how they respond. What's my point? Hmm, now if I say this, that really, really good. I think I'm intelligent. And Paul comes on the scene and basically says, if you think that way, then you've lost it. The power and the wisdom of the gospel is an understanding it. Understanding what's being said. 
He says, verse 20, where is the one who is wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the debater of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since the wisdom of God, the world did not know God through wisdom. It pleased God through the folly of what we preach to save those who believe. Let's be brutally honest. You take the message of the cross, of God coming as a, uh, born as a human, living life out to the age of 30, and then dying on a cross, being buried in the ground. And no, I can imagine, and you think that's wise? Do you think that displays wisdom? Do you think that really is, is good? And Paul's response is, yes, but you see, and understanding that, you begin to understand the wisdom of God. See, God's wisdom isn't according to our wisdom. Not according to our wisdom. Not according to you Greeks' wisdom. Not according to philosophy. See, God's wisdom is different. Take just from an image. Let's say, we'll take all of humanity from the time that Adam was created right through to the time that uh, the end of the tribulation period, all of, uh, well, probably the end of the millennium, all of humanity together. Let's take every single person working together with their best effort, the best they can do. How many people would be saved? Sorry, people? Zilch. Zero. Nada. Not a one. All of our effort could not save one person because basically we don't really even understand the problem. We don't. We think, the, you know, from the world's perspective, that the problem is poverty. Let's distribute the wealth around. That might make some things better, but it won't make all things better. Perhaps it's education. Let's educate everyone. No, it only just makes more educated fools. Um, you know, it's power. It's give authority to individuals and make them sort of responsible. And Switzerland, basically, when they have a law about to be passed, basically, everyone, there's a referendum and everyone gets to vote on it. I actually like the idea, but at the end of the day, what does it do about saving anyone? Nothing. It doesn't do nothing. All of human effort cannot achieve anything. You see, part of the problem comes down to us. We need to understand what the issue is. And the primary issue is our sin and separation from God, which leads to our separation from each other, which is, again, back to this book, back to the gospel. So how do you get around it? God's wisdom is declared in the gospel. God's power is displayed in the gospel, in the cross. How do you deal with a sinful humanity? How did God deal with it? How do you take sinful humanity, you, and save you? God is a righteous God. Sin, evil, requires punishment. How do you deal with it? You know, basically, if Jesus, you know, well, when they came, says, come down, you know, ask the angels to come. And Jesus says, I could, you know, legions of angels, I could ask, and they would have come in this Yeah, you know, how many people would have been saved if Jesus had come down from the cross? So, you see, the problem isn't one of how we think about the world's problem. It's a problem seen from God's perspective. How do we see the problem from his perspective? And so therefore, we cannot evaluate the gospel from the world's perspective. We have to evaluate it from his perspective. We look at, you know, basically Jesus in the ground, you know, that's us of defeat. The, you know, the Jews wanted power because they saw the problem basically is we need Rome's foot off our neck. So God will display his power by destroying the Romans and the Egyptians and the Syrians and the Turks. 
at the Palestinians and the Russians and the Americans. It doesn't matter who they really are. You know, God can show his power by destroying them, setting us free, liberating us. And we look for a sign that God is going to do that for us. But you see, that power, again, how many people does it save? So, no one, not one. There was no other way than the cross. There was no other way than the cross. And so God comes in the incarnation, born as a person, because it's the only way that, you know, basically there's a death. So you're beginning to understand the, perhaps the wisdom here. He comes, he grows, he matures, he preaches. But there's opposition. Well, there had to be opposition because who was going to put him on the cross? But in his death upon the cross, he dies, he takes upon himself the punishment that is due to you and all. See, I can die for my son, but that's eternal. You can die for your son, but that's eternal. I cannot die for Jeff's son. I cannot die for David's son. It's a bit like, you know, you want to, um, you know, you've bought some, I'll put on lay-by some furniture from a um, uh, department store. And you get a couple of months into, into making the payments, and you go to them and say, look, I can't pay for this furniture. But I'll tell you what I'll do. Anything else I'll buy, I'll make sure I pay for it. Has that removed the debt? No, it hasn't. You see, I can't remove the debt for you. You can't remove the debt for me. No matter how good you are or how good I am, because we all owe a debt that none of us can pay. And so someone who is of infinite worth must pay the penalty. Well, we're not of infinite worth. We're in a debt. And so it takes the second person of the Trinity to come in the incarnation and die as a person of infinite worth who can then die for all of humanity. Yes, he died upon the cross, but it's interesting that uh, Archbishop of Canterbury um, Anselm in the 12th century argued this point, not enough, it's coming back how far this sort of argument comes from, that God, that Jesus of infinite worth dies on behalf of humanity. And so therefore, the benefits of his death can be applied to all of humanity, to those who put their faith in him. And that's important. The faith is in him. Because if we put our faith in the message, what have we done? We just become exactly like the Greeks. And searching for wisdom. You see, the gospel message is something much, much bigger than that. And this comes down to um, how we think of, uh, just a little bit of a sidetrack here, how we think of Revelation. See, the gospel story is Jesus coming, dying, rising again, ascending into heaven. But Revelation also says, what does this mean? That he, what does it mean that he died upon the cross? What does that mean? Where's it going? See, God does something. Paul talks about what does that mean? And that's the whole book of the step. Take the gospel. What does it mean? What's the conclusions? What are the consequences of it? If you understand the gospel, you understand this. This is the point he's trying to make. But when you get sidetracked by issues of, of wisdom as perceived by the world, as power perceived by the world, you miss it. You miss that point of beginning. The heart of the gospel is a message that we are saved by God because God gives us himself. God gives us himself. And that's the heart of the gospel message. How were we saved? God the Father 
sent his son to live among us and die upon the cross. See, what the father gives him, in a sense, is giving himself for us and adopts us into his family. He sends the son to die on our behalf. He sends the spirit to apply all of that to us. The whole bucket, if you want, in which all the blessings of uh, the gospel message fit is this, that God gives us himself. That's the gospel message. God gives us himself. To get all the blessings that Jesus won upon the cross, we need to be given the Holy Spirit. But, uh, this is another point Anderson made. He commented, he said that basically, the death of Jesus upon the cross is a transaction that happens internally between the Son and the Father. Yes, Jesus died upon the cross, physical place, physical time, there, but it's a transaction that happens within the being of God. Therefore, how do we get to partake of it? God pours us out, His Spirit out on all those who put their faith in Him. And we're invited into that relationship. Again, it's all about God gives Himself for us, to us, and in us. So the gospel message isn't a message simply to be believed, because that way is going down the road of Greeks and searching for wisdom. It is the message about the person behind. I don't know how many of you have ever seen the, the movie Free Guy. I went up with the hands up. And a free Guy, uh, guy is a NPC character, a computer game, NPC, non player character. And somehow he becomes alive. And at the end of the message, the main girl is trying to tell him that because she's real and he's not, they can't have a relationship. And he grabs her hand and he says, let me make this easy for you. And he seeks to make it easy for her. Right at the end of his little speech, he says, but you see, at the end of the day, I'm really a love letter from someone to you. Out there is someone who wrote this message. And she comes out of the, uh, out of the game and she realizes who that person was. And she runs to find that person. Okay, that's what will happen. You see, the problem thing is here too is this: you see, you know, the gospel is a love letter from God to you and I about what He's done, who He is for us. See, faith at the end of the day is not in simply in the message. Well, you've got to believe the message. At the end of the day, it is about the God who gives us the message. It is about the God who gives us the message. <clears throat> Just a little bit of a, a way of understanding it. You can imagine a father, you know, is wealthy, a lot of money, buys presents for his kids, his sons and daughters, and they have the best of the best of the best. They have the best Lego. They have the best computer games. They have the best technology. <clears throat> and they use these things in their room. You know, they use these things, they play with them, they come out, you know, it's tea time, they're sitting at the table, hanging on their phone, or, uh, you know, watching something on TV, or uh, talking to a friend, you know, they come out, and all these things here, and it the Father's bought them everything. Everything they have has come from the Father. Contrast that just for a moment. A father who has grown up and experienced a lot, and he says, okay, I'm going to pay for us to all go on a trip. We're all going on a trip for you for, for six months. Pay the whole lot. Don't worry. You don't have to worry about food or uh, any travel costs or all that. I'm paying for the lot. And the father takes the family, his wife and his kids, on this trip. And they go to the places that he went to. They talk about the stories that the father did, you know, when he was there. They, they admire the beauty, they, they look at the history, they think about it. But you notice the difference here? One has the gifts, but no relationship. One has gifts and the relationship. That's the point that I'm trying to make. One is, we have the relationship. We don't simply have the gifts 
And that's a little bit of their problem. You know, God, oh, we've got all the gifts, aren't we? Wonderful, aren't we? It's, you know, great. It's great to be a Corinthian. Well, Corinthian Christian, anyway. It's great. We're better than the others. We're better than that bunch over there in Ephesus. Go to Corinth. Uh, type thing. And uh, Paul's almost response is actually, no. You might have all the gifts, but you are actually to be pity most of all because you see you don't really understand God and see this is the next bit and the end of the chapter just missing my point here but you know, God of the gospel in uh, 28 to 31 the problem is wisdom and power doesn't give you that. That's, you know, like this. You know, here's some toys to play with. This toy is wisdom. This toy is power. But God really is saying here, Paul is saying through, uh, God is saying through Paul, but see, the problem is you need God. And he really builds this around an Old Testament quote. Uh, verse 27, but God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. See, God's point is in the sense of nothing of this world can save you. Only I can. You see, if God, you know, does something with the wise in the world, then what's going to happen? I'm really, really wise. God owes me. Or God did it with my help. Or power. Yo, I'm, I've got power. My name's uh, uh, Putin. I've got power. No, God saved me because I deserved it. Because I was powerful. <clears throat> you begin to see the problems. Someone who says God owes me because of my wisdom. No. They're lost. You owe God owes me because I've got power. You know, the powerful deserve it. No, basically, no, still lost. Or the wealthy. Hey, I've got the money. You guys don't have it. You know, God loves the wealthy because wealth is a blessing from God. So therefore, God has blessed me. So God owes me. You see what we're, what we're doing when we do that sort of argument? I'm helping. God in some form or some way and so God says no I have done it in such a way that your wisdom your wealth your power means nothing so what does matter Paul says verse 31 so that it is written that the one who boasts boasts to the Lord Paul's quoting from uh, actually uh, Jeremiah Chapter 9, verse 23 and 24, where Jeremiah says this, uh, quotes from the Lord. This is what the Lord says. Let not the wise boast of his wisdom, or the strong boast of their strength, or the rich boast of their riches, but let the one who boasts boast about this, that they have, that they have the understanding to know me. That I am the Lord who exercises kindness, justice, and righteousness on the earth, for in these I delight to bless them. See, what is it I boast of? What is it that I you know should feel excited about if, for a better week? Because I don't want to get proud, you know, say proud of because then many will come. But what excites us? I really enjoy talking through with someone about the age of the planet Earth. They want to talk about the gospel? No, that doesn't interest me. I want to talk about the age of man. You know, what does that say? See, what excites us tells us how much you actually understand the gospel. If God excites you, if God is the one that when we were singing earlier, you were singing and you were thinking, this is the God who has saved me and loves me, then you're beginning to get the picture. To finish on, Paul actually gives us some very important points here. Not just the issue that they're dealing with and how to resolve them, but what does spiritual maturity really look like? 
What does spiritual maturity really look like? Because at the end of the day, it takes a spiritually mature man or woman to resolve conflict constructively. This is what I think Paul is getting at in this passage. A spiritually mature believer is one who understands the deep things of God, specifically that the person of God, sorry, that specifically that of the person of God and that of the work of God in our salvation. It's the heart of it. That's the problem the Corinthians had. Uh, that knowledge was fading away. That was going. The spiritually mature understand the deep things of God. This coming of the Son and the incarnation, the pouring out of the Spirit, are the two most kind of climactic events in history. Nothing else matches them. They are the means by which God saves us, but more importantly, they are the means by which God reveals himself to us. And as in, uh, Jeremiah says, uh, he says, uh, I uh, I am the Lord who exercises kindness, justice, and righteousness, for in these I delight. So much of theology is about you know, God's omnipotence, God's omnipresence, God's this, all about the nature of the being of God. But at the end of the day, that's not the most crucial things. You know, you can say, well, I know Steve Rian, he's five foot six, or thinks he's five foot six, gravity's made it a little bit shorter now. He's got grey hair, he's got a beard, you know, basically, he's got two arms, two legs, feet, I think. Um, he's a little bit, you know, round in the middle. Tell him on the level because the bubble's in the middle. Um, here's a little bit of a sense of you. But you see, it's not until you get to know me as a person that you really begin to know me and myself. And so it is that those who are spiritually mature know God and know what he delights in. A spiritually mature man or woman, God has ordered their priorities, values, and purpose based on the gospel revelation. Paul did that. You know, hey, I didn't come to baptize. I came to preach the gospel. And I wasn't worried about how well I did that. I preached the gospel faithfully. Paul is an example of one who has the priorities ordered correctly. This church had lost that. A spiritual son or daughter of the faith is one who is growing in their knowledge of and in their relationship. See, it's not just, you know, hey, this is a wonderful book. I'm really getting to know this book. Paul says this here. And Nehemiah says that there. And David says this over here. And like that. You see, the problem is, in the sense of knowing the book is not the same as knowing the God who sent us the message. So a spiritually mature man of God is one who is talking, praying, Relating to the God behind the message. We have found the one who loves us so, so much. And we're relating to him. Growing in our relationship with him. Developing that relationship with him. Developing that relationship with him with others. The idea that you can go and sit on a mountaintop on your own and grow in the knowledge and uh, depth of the Lord is a low rubbish. That was some fourth fifth century beginning of an idea where monasteries come from. You see, you can't begin to really know God on your own. You do it with other people. And so this becomes where the problem starts to come for the Corinthians and for some churches. You know, basically, I have a problem with you. I have a problem with God. We're never going to get past this. We're never going to grow and develop until we learn how to resolve it. Until we learn how to resolve it. And we can only do that together with God. Okay, let's close in prayer. Father, we thank you for Paul's words. Father, there is a wisdom there that is beyond our human perception. Father, as we begin to think through this book and think about what Paul says, we pray for wisdom that is displayed here that we might understand. We pray that your spirit would work in us and help us and guide us. 
Father, we pray that uh, <coughs> you will, your spirit would be with us. Father, we know that we will have conflict, we will have issues of time. May we be spiritually mature and learn how to resolve them. Father, we ask in Jesus' name.